Today I'm going to show you how to code basic movement for a 2D platformer, moving left and right and jumping. So for starting off, we're just going to change our node 2D scene to our um, main scene. We don't need any code in that right now, but we are also going to rename its script right here into the level one script. I'm just going to close this other file. So now we're going to add a child to it, and this is going to be a kinematic body 2D. And what we're going to do is we're going to right click it and go save branch as scene. And we're going to name it to the player. Then if we click on this right here, we'll open a new tab, play right here. We're going to rename this to player as well. Save it, save this, we're just going to delete it from level 1, then we're going to click on this thing right here, the little chain next to the plus button, and we're going to click on the player. And also, in the res folder right now, we're going to right click it, new folder, and say scenes, and we're also going to do new folder assets. So then we're gonna move all of these into scenes. Gonna have to delete this again. So I arranged that poorly. I'm gonna instance player again. And then we're gonna head over to the player file. Then for assets, we are going to drag and drop in some files that should be up in the GitHub. The ones that we're going to be using today are body, tile, player mask. But I'm just going to drag in the rest of them too. So I'm going to go in here and do new folder. I am going to make an effects folder. I'm going to make an enemy folder and I'm going to make an attacks folder. Then the gun will be going in the attacks folder, the melee will also be going in the attacks folder, the enemy mask, enemy, and that's it. Did I put the what's if not got in the player mask? And then what we're also going to do is because if we drag and drop this into our scene right here and zoom in, you'll see that it's quite blurry and that's because it's pixel art and what Gido does is it automatically puts a filter on things to blur them a bit and it's fine with regular sized images but with pixel art it just well, makes it look terrible. So then we're going to go over to the import tab right here next to the scene one and switch between these two. Then we're going to make sure if the player mask selected. It's going to go check this um, arrow in the filter off and we're going to click re-import and we can see is it immediately looks a lot better. I'm just going to go through and do this on all of the um, assets. And you can hold shift and click another, and that'll select multiple at a time, and you can do it like that. So now we're just going to delete this sprite. I'm going to zoom out. Uh, and then what we're going to do is going to go up to project, project settings, and we're going to scroll down to window which will be under the display category. So we're going to set width to 160, height to 90, and then let's change set width to 1080, and then test height to 720. Then you want to make sure the mode is in 2D and the aspect is in expand. I'm going to close it, save. Now we're going to add a sprite child to the player and we're just going to zoom in 
And in this spray, we're gonna drag in the player mask texture. You on the project, you can see a little thing in the corner over there. So then, now what we're gonna do is add in a another sprite. And this we're gonna we're gonna call player body. And we're also gonna rename the first sprite to player mask. And then we're gonna go into our body and drag it into here. Filter off. Now if you zoom out, you'll see there's a lot of stuff going on here. And that's because this is in a sprite sheet. And we use sprite sheets which contain every frame of animation for characters in order to reduce the amount of um, files that we have in a project and this helps. If we were to have these each as their own picture then what happens is that when we change our um, frame we gotta grab a whole new picture but then if we have a sprite sheet then we only have to change the position of the picture we have and then we just keep everything else of the picture visible and this just helps to keep the performance cost down so there's not as much RAM usage but then so then in order to adjust this we're just going to go to the right here under animation and then we got a Whenever you have a spreadsheet, you just count the width 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I'm going to put that into H frames. I'm going to count the height 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We put that into V frames. And then we now have a mostly still picture. So then we're going to move this down. Um, I'm just going to change this to frame 3 just because that's the one we're going to be using and then we're going to go into transform I'm going to set the position to 0 negative 0 0.5 that way it's centered just because this is a has uneven pixels so we have to use half a pixel positioning in order to get it at the right spot and then as you can see it, it overlaps our mask right now and that's because it is the last thing in our player over here. So basically what happens is when our player is created, it's going to create things from top to bottom. So the mask gets created first and then over top of it the body is going to be created. So in order to switch this, we just drag the body up here and then now the mask will be on top. I'm just going to move our body up until the, it can cover our eye and you can use the arrow keys to move things one pixel at a time I should have mentioned that earlier um, then we're gonna go into visibility for this and go self modulate and this is the player body and all we're gonna do is we're just gonna change everything to 25 25 Five, but we're gonna leave the A so you know red green blue and then alpha which is basically how see-through it is we drag this you can see it fades out so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a collision shape 2d and Godot makes collisions really easy which is one of the reasons why I like it a lot because we can basically let me so we just go and open the right here and do a new rectangle shape and we can just drag this but as you can see it's kind of like it's kind of hard to get it exactly to where our pixels meet so if we go up here and use pixel snap we turn that to on then you can see it'll snap more towards our player but because we've positioned the body on a weird angle like not in a proper pixel position it's in half positions since that it's at negative 0 0.5 we are going to need to scale this 
So we're gonna go into transform scale 0.5. Oh wait, that's the height. Uh, X 0.5. And I'm just gonna change that to 0 0.8, 0 0.75, and there it fits the body nicely. We don't really need to worry about the end bits of these masks. I'm uh, gonna go up to and move it down one. Okay. So now we're just gonna click this just to toggle the visibility of that off. And then, so now we've got our basic player right here. And we're going to add a script to it. And then now we're going to just declare a bunch of variables. So we're going to delete this. We're going to go var dead is equal to false. var on ground is equal to false. And we're not going to use all these variables immediately, but I just want to get some of them declared right away. And then was on oh wait var was on ground is equal to false var motion is equal to vector2 var gravity is equal to 80 for now var high pull is equal to false for acceleration is equal to 100 now for air acceleration is equal to 70 no actually 60 uh, for max speed is equal to 120 Bar friction is equal to uh, 250, let's say. Then bar jump power is equal to 5,000. And that's it for now. And I know it's a lot of variables already. There's more. <laughs> so we can go up here. I'm going to go enum, and we need the, the curly bar brackets, and we can just click enter. And then what we want is we're going to have uh, basic uh, ledge hanging. And that's it for now. I'm going to go down here and go bar state is equal to basic. So now we're going to go func physics process. I'm just going to put pass for now. So then physics process is similar to the ready function as it already has some stuff assigned to it. So the physics process, even if it's not called by another function, it gets called every frame. And then it's also linked into the kinematic body 2D, which our player is. That's the type of node we're using for them. Because it has built-in physics functions already in order to make it easier to make the player move and collide with things. So then we can also call some certain physics functions from the physics process. I'm going to go if dead equal to false if on ground is equal to true then we want gravity to be equal to 80 let me just indent some things down here uh, then else gravity plus equal 
Now, this is something that I just like to do in my games that I make, is that the longer you're in the air, the stronger gravity is going to pull you down, and it's going to help the player snap down faster during long falls. But it isn't something necessary, and you can take this plus equals gravity part out if you want, and if you remove that, then you can remove the gravity is equal to 80, because this is just a reset gravity once you hit the ground. And then we're just going to separate this. I'm going to comment here so you can leave a hashtag and that means that you're commenting so anything you write in front of this hashtag won't be considered code. So I'm just going to say gravity control because that's what this part right here does. And then I'm going to make another comment. Um, state control and I'm going to indent twice because we still want this to be under the if that is equal to false and we go match state and I'm just going to pass for now I don't even know if this works yeah but um what match does is it looks for something state is equal to that we will declare right here but the moment state is equal to basic, so then we're just going to go basic and then pass. And then we're going to add, gonna add ledge hanging to it as well, which we are going to pass. Then in the basic, what we want to do is update left right motion and since then we're gonna make this function func update left right motion and we're gonna also pass delta in which delta is basically like a latency between the different frames you know like some you know how because like in games you'll have frame drops and rises so then if you were calling let's say you're running at like 60 frames per second then gravity would be applying to you like 60 times in a second but then you get a frame drop that brings you all the way down to 5 frames per second then gravity is only going to be applying to you 5 times a second and your player is going to be affected by gravity a lot less and It'll make it look a lot laggier and buggier and it's, well, not good. So then if we time something by delta, then delta is the difference between this frame and the last frame, kind of, but like normalized. It helps it so that we're keeping the same amount of values in each frame. So then we're just going to go motion is equal to move and slide motion vector 2 0 negative 1 and the move and slide function basically p moves our uh, player across the screen and it's taking in motion as how it's moving and then this vector 2 0 negative 1 is coordinates of vector 2 or well not it doesn't always have to be coordinates but in this case it is so zero for the x and then negative one because something weird in Godot is that upwards is negative and downwards is positive and it takes a big bit of getting used to but it's not too much of a problem once you get used to it and why this is here exactly is to tell us which way it's up so since the y is flipped, negative 1 is up this way, negative 1 upwards, and 0 left and right is all up. And now in update left right motion, we're going to go if input dot is action pressed uh, UI left 
and motion dot x minus equals uh, not acceleration. Oh, I spelled that wrong. <laughs> Let me just change that. Wait. Okay. But I just changed the wrong thing because I'm dumb. Uh, so now what we're going to do is if input is action press UI right motion dot x plus equals acceleration. And we're just going to do times delta on both of them. And then over here, we do motion dot x is equal to clamp motion dot x negative max speed max speed. So let me just explain what I just wrote does. So the this right here, it checks if our keyboard the left arrow is pressed or the right arrow is pressed and if that happens on the left then we our motion.x is going to lower by acceleration so we're going to be moving left and then the same thing with this but you know right and then with motion.x is equal to clamp what this does is it makes it so that our motion cannot exceed the max speed and you might want to set this to zero but then what happens is we can't move left and that's something i make i made a mistake a couple times on when i was first learning because you have to be moving in a negative direction in order to go left and then the reason why we need this though is because we are gradually increasing our motion until it reaches max speed by minus equal. So this minus equal means motion dot x minus is equal to motion dot x minus acceleration times delta. It basically just means that we're just like skipping having to do this whole equals to what it was previously or what it is with these added math stuff and just going straight to like motion.x is equal to itself minus acceleration times delta then the same thing with the plus but with addition so if we run this current scene we can move left and right by pressing on the keyboard Although, as you can see, we kind of just keep going in one direction. So then now in our player script, what we're going to do is we're going to make it so that we can call put another if statement. So if input dot is action pressed UI left and input dot is action pressed y right and go equal to false and we also gotta go back here equal to false then colon indent uh, then we want motion uh, if motion dot x is bigger than zero so then if we're moving right actually I'll, I'll change that to small just because we do left here first so, so then we'll do left here as well then motion dot x plus equals friction times delta else dot x is bigger than zero motion dot x minus equals friction times delta so then now if we run the project and move left and right 
we will slow down very quickly once we release the key. And but you'll see that we're still moving a bit to the right. It might be easier to see on your screen than in this video. But while well, we are so then what, our, what we want to do is if if notion dot x is smaller than ten and notion dot x is bigger than ten dot x is equal to zero. So what this does is if our motion is between wait, bigger than negative 10. So if our motion is between negative 10 and 10, we're just going to set it to zero. So if we run the scene, we will stop when we release the key after a short amount of time. Now what we're going to want to do is move over to jumping because we've got the basic movement down there. It's kind of hard to see our player at the top right of the screen, so we're going to want to change that. So we're just going to create a new tile map and then we go new tile set and then we're going to go into our assets and drag in tile. We go new single tile. Just going to zoom in here. Ah, this is not a single tile snapping. Oh, this is uh, going to our snap action options. Sorry, I'm just going to change it to two by two. So we can select this. That's our region for the tile. I'm going to go into collision, select the box, look here, then we're going to want to save it and that is it so then oh got i mostly use auto tiles which i will explain in another video but at the moment it's not really ideal so i'm going to change this to four by four so it's six by six actually sorry my bad and then what we're going to do is we're just going to make a little box thing. <laughs> and I'm going to click on the player. And no. Oh, player. Drag them in here. And now, if we run this, we go left and right, we will collide with these tiles. If gravity is smaller than uh, 150, let's just say for now, then gravity plus equals 2. That way it won't get crazy high, you know, because we still want it to be somewhat to the same speed. Uh, then also, we want to call every frame motion dot y plus equals gravity times delta and now if we run it our player falls down and then we're actually just gonna move this into here I think yeah um and what we want to do is we're gonna make a new function uh, Get update jumping delta. So I'm just gonna close that for now. Let me go into here. Funk update jumping. Oh, jumping delta. Then we're gonna uh, do we have a jumping variable? I forget. Do not 
instead of a jumping variable, what we're going to do is we're going to add a node 2D and we're going to name this node timers because we're going to end up having a lot of timers. And we're going to add a timer as a child of it and we name it jump time. And timers, well, they basically track time because in the script itself, you can track um, frames pretty easily, how many frames have passed, but you can't um, track actual time very easily. It's a lot easier to do it with timers. So then I'm going to set this timer to one shot. And what one shot means is that it won't repeat itself. Once it finishes whatever wait time it is, in this case one second, it's not going to start again. It's just going to stop. And then auto start, we're not going to enable this, but what it does is it makes it so that as soon as this um, is created, it will start. So then I'm going to go into back to our variables. I'm going to create an onready variable jump time is equal to money chart jump time and already variables allow us to access our nodes on the side and then we can like get their parameters um, and some they have some other functions as well that we can then access so then with update jumping we say if on ground is equal to true and input that is action just pressed uh, UI up to the up arrow and we want jump time dot start we can just go down and then if jump time dot is stopped is equal to false so as long as the timer is still counting down then we're going to say motion dot y minus equals jump power times delta and let's see what happens nothing and that's because we don't have a way to detect if we're on the ground yet and there is a built-in function for this and it's like is on floor. It isn't entirely reliable. It can report a false true, a false positive. Um, you know, maybe you know that from statistics, maybe you don't, but basically it decides that we're on the floor when we're not on the floor sometimes, and it thinks that we're not on the floor when we're on the floor. So then, a better way we can do this, there's a simple way we can do it actually ourselves, is that we can create a new node, which is going to be our ground casts node. And then what we're going to do is add a recast 2D. 2D is important. And then what this does is it basically has a super tiny line that just goes in the direction, then we can check if it collides and decide what to do. And then we can also decide what it collides with. This is something I've forgotten to do up until now, but we're going to go into project settings and we'll go down to our layer names all the way at the bottom. 2D render, we're going to say environment is our first layer, and player is our second layer enemy is our third layer and that should be all we need for now we're also going to want to do the same thing in here and then if we go over here hover over the collision mask it still says layer one you just got to click off of it and click back onto it and then we've got environment player enemy so then how the layering system works is if we go over to the kinematic body, it's easier to explain. But, um, so each uh, collision object can have different collision layers. So then, if we set it to the player layer, it is now on the player layer. 
and then this does not set what it collides with, only what it is. And this can be nothing, or it could be everything, but in this case it's just going to be the player. Mask sets what it actually can collide with. Then if we set it to collide with the environment, it can collide with the environment. Turn that off, it can't. And we can do the same thing, it can collide with itself, which normally don't really want to do that. It's not really a point with the player, at least. Or it can collide with enemies, or we can have multiple. But then, if we have this mask turned off, and we go over to our main scene, the tile map, will also have a collision. Right now it's on the environment layer, it collides with the environment, and we can just turn the mask off. We can have it so that it collides with the player, and even though the player isn't set to collide with it, it will still trigger a collision if the player tries to move into it. So if one of the two has a mask that is set to collide with the layer of the other one, then they will collide. And I know it's a bit confusing, but for now we're going to leave it so that the tile map is no mask and is on the environment layer, and then the player has the layer of the player, and collides with the environment on the mask. Okay, so with that explained, we can head over to our Recal Studio, and we're going to rename this uh, Ground Cast 1. And then click Enabled. I'm just going to move this down to the bottom of the player. I'm going to move it left. Byte. And we need to use Transform, negative 1.5. Now it's on the edge of our collision box right here. And then we are going to make it go down 0.1. That's all that we need. And then we're just going to duplicate it. Move it over to the center. And duplicate this. move it over to the other side of the player. And then what we're just going to do is toggle the visibility of this. So then we need to go back up here and we are going to declare some more onReady variables. Go onReady variable count cast one is equal to ground cast oh wait money dot ground cast one. You have to have this money symbol, it's basically a get, so it gets whatever is equal to the path that you pass in afterwards, so it goes to ground casts, and then this slash means that it goes to a child of the ground casts, it's one of the things that are underneath it, and then we're looking for ground cast 1, so we grabbed ground cast 1. So now we're just gonna duplicate this line a couple times, except we're going to change it to 2, 3, 2, 3. Now we've got all our ground casts. And then here, we're going to do update on ground. And this time we don't need our delta. Um, I'm actually going to move this in front of the update jumping. Because what happens is when you call a function, it stops going forward through this, and it goes through the function, and then it will start going through this again. So, jumping, in order to jump we have to be on the ground. We want to check if we're on the ground in the same frame that we're going to be jumping, not one frame behind. Even though it doesn't make much of a difference, uh, it'll still decrease the input latency by a bit. Not really input latency, but the latency between being able to jump. So then we're gonna go in here in between update left straight motion and update jumping and we'll func update on ground. I'm gonna say if ground cast one dot is colliding or ground cast two 
dot what's the error here? Affected for ground cast two that is colliding or ground cast three dot is colliding pass the other error here. I have no idea why it's doing this. Oh, I forgot to put in these on all of these. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Yeah, I'm making a lot of spelling mistakes. Alright, so then I'm gonna do on ground is equal to true, else on ground is equal to false. And what this does is the ors, what they do is it's basically like an elif but in the same if statement. So if ground cast 1 is colliding, then this if statement will be true and we'll call whatever's here. But then, or if Chromecast 2 is colliding, then it'll also be true. And we'll call whatever's in here. Same with Chromecast 3, it'll call whatever's in here. So then, now what we're going to do is we're just going to run the game. We land on the ground, press up, error message. And why is this here? Breakpoint. I accidentally added that. Okay, so we just shoot up. <laughs> uh, yeah, by the way, the breakpoint, um, if you, I think you can click, yeah, you can click right here. And what this does is it'll just crash the game when it gets to this line. And that can be useful for bug testing, but if you have any, you're gonna wanna remove them. <laughs> because we're not really bug testing and you don't use them very often when you're bug testing either. Now since jump power was really high we're just gonna lower that to 1000. See what happens. Still quite high. I think it could be that um also I jumped on is really high so I want to change this to 0.05 and now see what happens. I got like a little hop and that's not bad can we jump up two blocks at a time no I think I'd like to get it that we can jump two tiles at a time uh, yeah it seems that gravity is a little weak though as well you know like kind of floating for a bit and we don't want that and change gravity to 120. Just adjusting variables right now. I think I'm gonna bring gravity all the way up to 200. I'm gonna have to go to here, change this to 250. Actually, we have to change it in here as well if we change it up here. So gravity is equal to 150. We hardly get any jumping. But, uh, it feels kind of snappy, not floaty anymore. Although our uh, acceleration and max speed I think is a little high. I'm going to reduce this to 100. Reduce this to 80, this can be 40. That's okay for now, I just want to increase the jump height. Kinda large. Uh, So sometimes it appears that we are 
jumping higher than what we usually jump. So we'll have to fix that. Right now I think what we should do is add our own input. So we go into the input map over at the top here in project settings. What we can do is we can add our own uh, input actions. So we're going to say left. And for me, I'm, I like using WASD. So I'm just going to set up controls to work with that. And you can add a key by clicking on this plus button key. You then press the key and you click OK. Then we're going to add a jump rather than an up. And I'm going to have that as spacebar. I'm going to close this, change this to jump. And this can be right, left, left, right. Just take away the UI underscore. And now we. Oh, why does these breakpoints keep on getting out of them? I swear I'm not clicking all the time. Now you can use the A and D and space bars in order to get a working movement. And this does need a lot more work to be put on to make it feel good, you know, like it's it's not feeling very well at the moment. But I am going to end this tutorial as it is getting a little long. And I will continue on improving the movement feel in the next video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you want to see more content like this as I will be making more.